So I don't know if you agree, but PCSLS or post crash shift lever syndrome might just be the worst thing about crashing. I mean, bones, they will heal and road rash has some Wolverine magic going on there, hailing itself just by pure will. But scratch up shift levers, they will haunt you and taunt you every time you take your bike out. It keeps reminding you of how bad you took that goddamn corner. So that is what I'm going to try and show you how I fix a day. And in my opinion, they even look better than they did before the crash. Some of you might just say, oh great, you turned in your Dura-Ace levers into Ultegra levers. But in my opinion, I think the Ultegra style finish actually looks better than Dura-Ace. But now I have that finish combined with the weight of Dura-Ace. So it's a win-win. But for those who prefer a little bit more character, you could easily do a custom paint job by following along these steps as well. But I need to start with a few disclaimers. Normally when I do these kinds of DIY and maintenance videos, I always do it with the goal of showing people that it's not hard to work on your own bike. It shouldn't be intimidating. Bikes are simple machines and you don't need to be a professional mechanic or an engineer to, to work and maintain your bikes. This though might be a bit overkill for some people. If you're still struggling with say tubeless tire setup, this is probably not the place to start. Also, the levers are not meant to be taken apart like I do in this video. This will definitely uh, void your uh, warranty if the crash didn't do that already. But yeah. And more importantly, you can't get any spare parts for the internals of this. So if you break something or lose something, which is definitely a possibility, yeah, you could be shit out of luck. So don't come screaming, uh, telling me that I didn't warn you. But if you're willing to take the risk, this how-to will work for uh, the current Shimano 12-speed Di2 levers, and that is Dura-Ace, Ultegra, and 105. So let's get into this. All right, so my plan here was to take this apart down to the level that I could sand down the brake lever blade as well as the Darth Vader looking helmet part that sits above the brake lever. Well, you know what I mean. The rubber hoods were pretty beat up as you can see. Luckily, the rubber hoods are one of the few replacement parts that are actually available to buy for these levers. Removing the bar clamp and the bolt will make that rubber hood removal a bit easier and I really should have removed the little stump of hose and hose nut to make it even easier. I did eventually remove this later on before reassembly, so yeah. As you can see here, a little corner piece of that Vader helmet came off that was damaged in the crash, but that I will just have to live with. It's not as noticeable in the end in my opinion. Anyway, with a little brute force and some patience, the rubber hood eventually came off, so I could start the proper disassembly by removing the DI2 cable port connector thingamajing. These screws are Torx T7, which is quite unusual, and it's just another reminder that this was never meant to be serviced by home punters like us. Two screws and a little metal plate. I highly recommend using some kind of parts organizer like I used here to keep everything in order. As you see, the upper row in mine is the other shift lever that I have disassembled before this one. It will make it easier when putting it all back together again, because I can just go in reverse order. Now there's two more T7 screws on each side of the lever and once those are out the Vader helmet comes off but the wire going down to the shift buttons prevents me from removing it completely and the wires are molded or epoxied into that Vader helmet so you can't detach the wires by themselves. I really should stop referring this to Vader I know but yeah, can't help it. Then it was time for the sketches part of the disassembly since we basically need to tap out the pivot pin, or whatever you call this, with force. What you need is some kind of a punch on old sacrificial screwdriver uh, that has a smaller shaft than 4.9 millimeters. And as you can see, I struggle a bit using a punch that was too big at first, thinking I would just need to get those first few millimeters loose. In the end, I had to tap it out all the way with an old screwdriver. Doing this against a vise or something solid would have uh, been better. 
but I got it out in the end. And with that, the whole lever comes apart from the lever body, including this hinge fork looking thing. And this is the part that pulls on the master cylinder. It's also where the reach adjustment is located. If you are unlucky, the springs inside this might fall out, but don't worry, we will cover that in the reassembly section. Again, keeping the parts together and organized is a very good idea. Trust me. So now the last step is to take apart the actual DI2 switches from the brake lever. The order you do this in doesn't really matter. I started by removing the 2mm hex bolt hidden under this little rubber cover. Nothing really comes loose with just that. I also need to remove the two small Torx T5 screws on the actual DI2 switches. As you can see here, the whole thing comes apart after this and there are a total of three springs hiding back there, two tiny ones and a slightly bigger one, so be careful not to lose any of those. And don't worry if you didn't manage to memorize where each of those springs came flying out from, I will cover that in the reassembly section. The last step here before I'm done with this disassembly is to get the button switch out from the lever so I can work on them separately. And while I probably could have removed the little clip and pin at the top, I could actually push the switch out with a little bit of force, like so. And to top this section off, I just want to hammer home this whole thing about keeping parts organized. And parts like the bar clamp, for example, that can go back into the lever body itself, just to have as few loose parts as possible lying around. Then it was time for a little rubbing fun. I did a step outside, hence the worst angle and the lighting looking all crazy. Uh, I just wanted to get the camera as far away as possible from any flying carbon composite dust and stuff like that. But it's pretty straightforward in any case. I wet sanded the surface down in three steps. I started with 160 grit sandpaper, moved on to 300 grit and did a final pass with 600 grit paper. The only reason I went with this particular grits is that is what I had in my stash for the time being. If I were to buy new I would probably go with something lower grit for the first pass at least. It took quite a while to get all that clear coat off. And even when I thought it was all gone I did my 300 grit pass and wiped it dry. It turned out it wasn't at all completely gone as you can see here. So I went back to 160 grit for another pass. This took way longer than expected uh, so probably not something for the TikTok crowd out there and eventually I got it to this state. This was also when I decided to skip any paint plants I originally had because I really like how this raw finish looked and having recently used a CR1 coating on my bike frame I decided to go that route instead because I know that coating preserved the matte finish really nicely. Also it wouldn't add nearly as much weight as paint would, so there's always that. But first it was time to tackle the Vader helmet. While it's pretty water resistant as is, and I didn't really plan dunking this thing in water, I still wanted to protect it a bit from the wet sanding, so I wrapped the inner parts and wires in saran wrap and electrical tape worked surprisingly well despite how it looks. Because of the angles of this piece and how small the area is, the sanding was even more tedious than the brake lever. The material is some kind of hard plastic material, it's not carbon like the lever, at least I think it is, feel free to correct me. It didn't quite get the same nice finish as the lever blade, I think I spent more time sanding this than the actual lever blade. So in the end this is the result after a lot of rubbing and sanding and a really sore hand. I will admit the Vader helmet doesn't look as even or good as the lever does, especially when you look at it up close like this. But compared to where I came from, I was satisfied enough thinking it would look decent enough once back together with the rubber hoods and all. So for the coating I made this little stand or jig from a shitty broken Garmin mount so I had something to hold on to without messing up the coating and keeping it from tipping over. The CR1 coating they call glass coating here in Japan but I guess it's very similar to ceramic coating if you're wondering. Since this is probably not something you can find outside Japan anyway I won't go crazy in depth but it's applied with a microfiber cloth, uh, so leaving it like 15-20 minutes between coats. The Vader helmet absorbed the coating like a sponge, so I probably put it like 6 or 7 coats in the end. 
while it feels pretty dry after an hour or so, the cure time is actually 300 hours for this CR1 stuff. And I'm not going to lie, I did not wait two weeks, more like a week before I started putting everything back together. And since it was about a week between disassembly and reassembly, that's why it was so important to have that organizer thingamajing. Now I just need to reassemble everything in reverse order. And having those parts line up in that order really helps. Starting by pressing that DI2 switch back into the lever behind the pin. After that I reattach the shift lever buttons back. So I don't have to worry about those not lining up when installing all the DI2 switch parts. First, this little plastic piece will line up like so on the two screw holes. Here I can see the two small plus shaped pins that each will have one of those small springs with the plastic ring facing up. Having tweezers helped me a lot here. Then in the larger hole, the bigger spring will go over the small one like this. And then I will just need to line up the DI2 switch on top of the larger spring. After that, lining it up with the screw holes. Pressing down that spring and keeping that pressure on until I could secure it with both screws. That was rather fiddly and the spring went flying off camera once, I won't lie. A quick check that the button feels nice and clicky like they should. Then it was time for the hardest part of the reassembly in my opinion, and that is to get the hinge back in place and that pivot pin through everything. As you can see the spring has come loose from the hinge thing in my case. If you are careful during this assembly, they might stay in place, so yeah, keep that in mind. But if they didn't, they will go back in this orientation. While it's hard to see here, the plastic spacer the spring goes around has a lip so the spring can only slide off in one direction. That lip on both of those plastic parts should face each other in the middle of the hinge. It's hard to explain this in words, so I just take a really close look at this part in the video if you're struggling. Here you can see I have those two ends of those springs sticking up. They should press against the rear pin on the top of the lever. The two sprongs or fork looking end will hook behind the master piston yoke inside the lever body. To get the hole to line up for the pivot pin, I need to put some tension on those springs and this will in turn want to push those springs out of the hinge, making it very tricky to get the pivot pin back in place. I struggled a lot on the first level, but on the second one I figured out that first getting the hinge in place and then threading a 4mm hex key through the whole thing, then push in the pin from the bottom at the same time using that hex key to make sure the spacers line up one piece at a time, definitely a bit fiddly, but doable in the end. I couldn't really brute force it with a hammer or something like that because that could damage those small plastic spring spacer thingamajings. And like I mentioned in the beginning, you can't get any of these small parts at spares, at least officially. But with a bit of patience and a little fiddling, uh, I finally got the last part through and that is by far the worst part done. The rest is easy compared to that. Uh, just putting back the last two screws to secure the Vader helmet, then attach the cable port again with the little plate and the last two screws. The last step for me was to put on a brand new rubber hood and I know there's a few hacks out there for putting brand new hoods on but removing the bar clamp and the hose nut and then just trying to work it in small increments I find I can always get it on without using any kind of lubrication so to speak. That's done. I think it looks pretty damn sweet, if I can say so myself.
Oh yeah, if you're wondering, they, they still work. I didn't break them, luckily. Now, what about weight saving? I hear you scream and I am a donkey. When I disassembled this, I actually put the parts on the scale because I wanted to know that myself, of course, but I totally forgot to weigh the parts before I reassembled it. And of course, I didn't realize this until after the case. And I'm sorry, I'm not taking this apart again. It was too much of a hassle to put it back together. So you will have to uh, be satisfied with the complete weight, which is in the end about three and a half, four grams lighter than when I weighed this on the Slayer of Grams uh, channel. So yeah, it, it's, it's, you don't really do this for weight saving. And I know uh, some of you might say, what about Drillium? Couldn't you do some Drillium magic on these? And there's not really much uh, areas to do any Drillium. There's this small piece at the end of the hood, but I don't think that would be worth anything really. Maybe you could shave off another gram. Of course I should do that, but um, yeah, I don't think it's worth it, unfortunately. And I'm pretty bad at Drillium anyway, so it wouldn't look nice either. Yeah. Lastly, I just want to give a shout out to uh, di2 underscore gp on Instagram, who actually showed that this was possible to do in the first place. And of course, uh, when it comes to all your di2 needs, bettershifting.com, good stuff. And that's pretty much it. Drink safe, ride water, and peace.